Hello and welcome to episode 37 of our Conversation to Connect, Let's Get Real Talk, powered by Exceptional Connections. I'm Cindy O'Neill Dady, the founder and chief connector of Exceptional Connections since 2009. At Exceptional Connections, we offer intentional and innovative solutions to boost your business. And each month we nominate different members of our community to have meaningful conversations with. And so be sure to make yourself comfortable with a beverage of your choice. Um, mine is tea today. Um, and take notes. Um, be sure to add comments to the chat box to engage with us during our conversation. And about the 45 minute mark, we're gonna be able to unmute the lines and invite our listeners to ask questions, share their ahas, their epiphanies, and enter into our thought provoking conversation. So the inspiration of our bi-weekly conversations to connect, let's get real talks, is to create purposeful conversations. And we really desire to be relevant during these challenging and uncertain times. And of course, to support our community to make an impact in the world and stay connected. So as we get started, I invite you to set aside any distractions and invest your attention to the conversation that is about to unfold. And just look for one idea, something that you can take away and put into action so that you don't cheat yourself out of the time that you've invested here. So our conversation to connect this week is with Karen McNamara. Um, she is a click consultant in Silverdale, Washington. So welcome, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited about this conversation with you today. We're going to be talking about how to say it. Um, marketing to different generations. So before we dive into this intriguing talk, I want to take a moment to introduce Karen to our community. So Karen McNamara, as, a business, as business owners and leaders, we face challenges every day, planning, budgeting, staffing, sales, marketing, team building, change, and even conflict management. Communication and connection are key in all these areas, Karen McNamara is a co-owner of Click Consultants, LLC, a leadership and communications consulting company. She has 27 years of leadership consulting, is an author, and an expert in generational communication strategies. In this discussion, Karen will share a bit about why generations look at the world through different lenses and some marketing strategies for reaching your target generation. So get ready to laugh, learn, and apply techniques to connect generations for business success. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much. And thank you for the time we've already spent talking about this really exciting topic. I've enjoyed it so much. And I'm our listeners are in for a treat. Um, just really great insights. And the bottom line is just to help us to communicate better with our loved ones, with our community, with our family, you know, just, uh, it goes across the board, even our, in our businesses. Um, so share, Karen, would you share with our listeners a bit more about your journey and your passion for understanding how the generations speak different languages and how important it is to learn how to translate them? <laughs> I'm happy to. I would say, you know, my interest in this began when I had kids <laughs> because I started to see that the, my kids really looked at the world differently than I did and communicating with them wasn't the same as communicating with my peers. And throughout my career, I was in the Navy for 25 years as a nurse. And then I got my master's in education about halfway through and found myself doing a lot of teaching and being put in charge of leadership development. And I was beginning to see that it was really important that we communicate to the different generations because all of a sudden we were having lots of different generations in the workforce, volunteering, and even at home. And for the first time ever, we have five generations that are actually working together or volunteering together or perhaps even living under the same roof. So I began doing this teaching as part of my leadership development at an organization uh, many years ago. And at the same time, my son was working on his MBA and he was intrigued by the leadership stuff. Said, hey, can I look at this? And he did. 
And then I looked at it and he said, you know, mom, you need to add more technology to this. It's kind of boring. So I said, okay, but just don't make it too tough for me. And so I started adding it in. It was a lot better. And then he came back and said, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to do this together. And I thought, well, that's kind of a novel idea. And we started chatting together. And we were in Toastmasters and presented it to our Toastmasters group. And of course, they gave us lots of feedback. So we played with it, tweaked it, created little skits. And all of a sudden, people started asking us, hey, come talk to us. We want to get this. We want to understand the generations better. So we started doing that. And then he comes back to me a while later and he says, you know, we got to make a business out of this. So in 2011, our company, Click Consulted, was started. And it's just grown from there. And it's been so rich being able to do this along with my son. He's a millennial. I'm a boomer. And we absolutely look at the world through different lenses. That's beautiful. And, and it shows that you walk your talk, right? Having that collaboration with your son not only enriches your presentation because you're coming from different perspectives, but it also shows the power of what you're what you're sharing with people, right? That you can indeed um, have a, you know, even a business relationship with a family member, which is not easy. And I know that Stacy mentioned in the chat box that she has four generations in her family. So, you know, you're doing something right too, Stacy, um, because it's not easy to have uh, business relationships with family members in many cases. I know for many years, my husband and I worked very closely together, um, but Anyway, well, let's jump in because you have so much information to share and I want to um, dive in and, and give the, our listeners the benefit of that. So let's start off with sharing your three takeaways that people will be able to experience from this um, conversation today. Well, first off, I want everyone to be able to understand a little bit about the generation, sort of define them so that we can have a framework that is common to all of us. And then I want us to be able to see how that works again with our communication and how might that relate to a takeaway with marketing to our target audience. Beautiful. Go ahead and set the stage for that. All right. So when you read the literature, what you'll find is that there's a little bit of variance in the years for the different generations. You might see as much as maybe five years on either end. But what I'll do is I'll speak to what a lot of the literature uses, sort of 20 year blocks of time. And it comes out of the, the Census Bureau and how they divide people up. And so those are the definitions that I'll use today. And what I'll do is I'll state them, but I'll also put them in the chat so that you have them just to kind of look back at. So let me just stick them in the chat here real quickly and then we'll, we'll uh, speak to them. Because yeah, what I've learned is that the most important part of communicating with a generation is understanding where they come from, a little bit about them. And, and um, that matters even more than your personality style matters more than your, your family history, your genetics, all of that. So let's look at the different generations for definition purposes today. The first generation I'll speak to is the veterans generation. And that one, some people call it the matures, the World War I generation. I've heard the greatest generation. You'll see that in, in some literature. And it's those that were born before 1940. So in my case, that would be like my parents, my mom's in her 90s. So she would be in the, the veterans generation. Then there's the boomers generation. The boomers generation came right after the veterans and that was about 1940 to 1960. And that's the people that are currently like at the top of the workforce. And, uh, but also are looking now at retirement and looking at sort of changing their lives. Next came the generation X, which is 1960 to 1980. And you'll notice there's, there's um, on the, in the chat there, there are years associated or, or numbers associated with that. And that is in the US. So that is not looking at other countries. 
on, on numbers, but the information is the same in other countries, just the numbers might be different. Like, like for example, there's 35 million um, uh, Gen Xers right now. Then the millennials came next and they've probably gotten the most PR, good and bad, in the generational talks these days. And they're those that were born between 1980 and 2000. So those are the folks in their 30s now. They'd be like, my kids are millennials. Um, and they're the ones that are coming up in the workforce. And if they haven't already uh, taken over some of the executive roles, they will be very soon. And then the generation that's just coming into the workforce, Generation I, some people call it Generation I for internet, some call it Generation Z, X, Y, Z. Um, some people call it globals, and that's those born after 2000. And so that would be like the children of uh, the Generation X or, uh, yeah, mostly Generation X, some possibly boomers as well might be coming up in that time frame. So those are the framework, the groupings. And again, it's not critical that on the years because you might find yourself identifying with one either above or below you, you know, before or after you because of your experience. So here's the real important point that I wanna make. And that is that when we grow up, our formative years are between eight and 18. What that means is that the things around us during that time frame impact us. So seminal events that we were exposed to during those formative years are what help change the way we look at the world. So the reason they identify different generations is because if you understand what took place during those formative periods, you can understand why they look at the world differently. Does that make sense? Um, what, what I, at first I thought, well, yeah, that would, that makes sense. But I thought, oh, genetics, culture, where you live, all of that's gonna make more difference. But what we found is it doesn't matter where you are in the world, what happens around you makes even more difference than your family or your heritage. And that to me was pretty amazing to learn and to witness. That's fascinating. It really is. Cause you're right. It, it, it kind of shakes a paradigm of other things that we've been told over the years in terms of what really shapes us. But that makes sense because, you know, eight and 18, I mean, sometimes they, I've heard even, cause I do a lot of early childhood education and I've homeschooled my kids and taught in the homeschool settings. You know, I personally feel like it's younger than that, you know, the, in terms of formative, but formative for seminal events, I can see there would need to be, the child would be a little, need to be a little older to understand what's going on in the world. Yeah, that's actually a really good clarification point because we obviously learn, we start learning very young and, and they are formative years, but what impacts us and what really shifts the way we look are those seminal events, those really right. big things that when you right. look back and you think, like, I'm a boomer, and there are certain events that happened when I was growing up that I know exactly where I was, yep. when that happened, what yep. time, and it makes a difference in how I look at the world. Right, absolutely. So what comes to mind for me is I remember I was a little girl, and gosh, I'm trying to think, so when Kennedy was assassinated, I remember I was, I must have been kindergarten because we were, yeah, kindergarten, we, we were living in Los Angeles. And I remember this black and white TV and my mom is kneeled down in front of it and weeping, just weeping. And so that's what impacted me is how it impacted my mom. Yeah, yeah. So and and are, during that same time frame for the boomers in the, in the room, I know we've got at least a couple of boomers here. Where were you when we landed on the moon for the first time? We remember that it was an opportunity, a time of affluence and opportunity. So we look at that and we remember and we think of possibilities. Um, yeah, those kind of events are very, they shape us and they, yeah. they influence how we look at the world and the hope that we have or, you know, whatever the situation is, it, it's really fascinating. Um, so 
the things that Karen's going to be kind of unfolding here before we get going too far is she's just defined the different gener generations and then, you know, help us to understand why they view the world the way they do, um, why they do view it differently. And then we're going to wind up with strategies for marketing to your target generation. So, um, so I love the way you layer upon the foundation that you just set um, for the, the diff five different gen generations. And one thing I just want to kind of throw in is, is there a name for the generation that's coming up? You know, because if we're roughly working on 20 year increments, so generation after generation I or Z, um, which is, what did you say, 2000 to 2020-ish, right? right? So now we're going into this next generation, 2020 and to 2040-ish. Um, do they have an, is there a name? Is that labeled yet or is that yet to? No, not yet. There, okay. there isn't one just yet uh, because they, they're trying right now to focus a lot on the generation I slash Z because they're really in those formative years now and the things that are happening and we're trying to look at how do we predict what they're going to do and how they're going to react and so there's a lot of focus on that generation right now. And then as they shift up and the veterans generation sort of moves off the, the platform, we'll br be bringing up that next one. Okay, so it's usually five at a time that they're working with. Well, actually no, because yeah. this is the first time we've ever really had five at the same time. Oh. Okay. Because we're living longer. Okay. You know, it used to be that we didn't live this long. We didn't work as long. We didn't have, so we didn't have five generations in the workforce. We had three, mm -hmm. maybe four at the outstretch, but we've never mm -hmm. had five, you know, because even the veterans generation or some of them are coming back and volunteering. They want to still feel like they can make a big impact. It's, it's yes. really interesting. It's a, and that's why I think it's so critical to understand the perspective of each generation, because that helps so much in the communication and the partnering, especially like Stacy, you said you have multiple generations in your family. There's lots of dynamics and I would love to hear some of your feedback on that. I'm sure as we, we talk about this, you'll, you'll be able to see or identify or give examples of some of the things that we talk about. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in and, you know, Help us to understand the different generations and you know what they re represent. You know, kind of flesh out the the generations that you laid out for us. Absolutely. So let's start with the veterans generation. So that would be the generation, those folks that were born before 1940. So with that particular generation, if you think about what was going on between their ages of eight and 18, okay. So now we're talking about rough times. We're talking about Pearl Harbor, Korean War, the Depression, the flu, uh, Social Security was starting. It, it was a big time of unsettled depression and tough. And so there was a lot of focus. Everyone was going off to war. So there was a lot of focus on military. So this particular generation has high respect for military because that's what helped them be able to move forward. They also know the value of pulling together during rough times. Like if you talk to this generation about the flu epidemic, you say, oh, that must have been horrible to go through. They'll look back on it and they'll say, you know, I don't really remember it that way. I remember us pulling together as a family. We ate together, we worked together. We just made it work. Yes, we couldn't go out and do other things, but it was okay. It brought us together as a family. So it, it was a time where family meant a lot, the war, military, respect, all of that was a big part of their life. So if you think about that, when you're communicating with this generation, it's important to have that in mind. If you disrespect the elders or you disrespect the military or e even if they weren't in the war they were it, they experienced it they experienced those hard times and they didn't go at that time the thought of going on to college was not even considered because they just had to get food on the table so they went into trades 
So, so that's their framework and they saved things. You know, you, a lot of things I used to laugh at my mom until of course we went into the pandemic and I'm like, oh, I get it. She would hoard toilet paper. You know, she would have, you know, she'd say, I'd be over there and I'd say, you need anything from the store? Oh, I need toilet paper. I said, mom, you've got 30 rolls. She said, but I might have company. I might need that. <laughs> I love it. Okay, mom, I really think you're going to be okay. But it was, it was a mindset. And that's the point I want to make about this generation. And when you are working with them, let them tell their story. Because you know what? They have stories to tell and lessons we can learn along the way. And if you listen to them, they will listen to you and they want to learn new things too. I'll give an example, my son with my mom. So my, my mom was, I think at the time she was in her eighties and she didn't have internet or any type of technology. And my son says, you know, hey, G Ma, you ought to have some, some technology here. I don't need that, she said. And he says, let me show you something. So he pulls up her screen and he puts pictures of her grandkids on there. Well, all of a sudden she just lit up. You mean I can see my grandkids? She didn't live right by them. He says, oh yeah. He says, let me show you how you do this. I'll get you up on Facebook. And so he did it right in front of her and she was so excited. And then he showed her how she could do email and she realized, oh, I can write to the president every day. And she <laughs> did, and she still does. So it was really the two generations kind of working together, which was. Oh, I love that. It's beautiful. It, it reminds me about my, you know, growing up when we went to my dad's parents' home, they had pictures, they had three boys and they were all in the military. And so my dad with his Navy and my uncle with his Marine and then, you know, army from my other uncle. And that was like a badge of honor, right? That my sons were in the military and and so my dad is, you know, often told us that's what young men did at that time. You know, they went into straight from high school, right into the military. And then his father was, you're talking about being tradesmen. His father was a, a commercial and residential uh, painter. And so that's what my dad, that's the trade my dad learned when he was a young boy. And then when he came back from the military, um, he ended up becoming an accountant and going to school, but, um, but you're right. I, I think it's, it's interesting that in that particular generation, that era, it was very common for them to go straight into the military and to have that be, um, you know, just something that you do, not only to support your country, but also, um, you know, that was the pathway before college. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, my, my husband's mother is also 93 and she has a mantle and across that mantle is every single military member of her family. And she is extremely proud of that. And everyone that walks in, she shares that with. Yes. And some of the later generations don't have that same understanding because they didn't experience the war and the right. depression in the same way. Right. So that's what's important to understand. So the next generation is the boomer generation. And that was between 1940, 1960-ish, you know, that, that time frame. okay? So I say ish because of the, the variance there, but as my husband was born, you know, six years before me, so he's a little bit, he identifies with some of the veterans generation more than I do, and I identify boomer all the way. That's just, uh, you know, that's where I, I identify. And I think about, the seminal events, if you think about what happened during my lifetime and a couple of yours, or at least in, in the, the boomer generation, what were the key things? Well, we already mentioned, you know, Kennedy, we mentioned the, uh, the lunar landing, there are things like Woodstock, things like Social Security, all of those. And it was post-depression. And that was a big part for me. I remember so much people talking about you know, how much time, it's better now. You can have anything you want. The sky's the limit. We can go to space. We can, we can go to college. We can do whatever you want, you can do. And we started doing all of these things for our kids too. We wanted for our kids as well. So I wanted my kids to go to college. That was a high priority. I wanted that. And I wanted my kids 
to have different sports and different opportunities and all of that. So all of those things were a big part of, of what we did. And I felt like it was so important, but work was really important too. You know, our generation really, you know, work sort of defines you. And you had, if you had a gap in your resume, that was not good because it said, you know, you messed up somewhere along the way. Now you expect those, you expect every couple of years to move. Otherwise, well, why aren't you moving around? Why aren't you getting other experiences? It's a different time. But at that time, it was all about the organization and you supported that organization and you were with it pretty much for your career. And it's a gold was, watch, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, there was also during that time, I remember, I remember my kids being exposed to stuff a lot earlier than me like um, drugs, alcohol, smoking, uh, violence. They, it was starting to happen at a much earlier age than what I experienced um, it as. You know, the veterans generation kind of lived a lot of that, but then we came out of it and I didn't experience it. And then all of a sudden my kids were starting to experience it a little bit more. So when you're working with boomers and you're marketing to boomers, you have to think about um, the, we want to learn, we want exposure. You also use a blend of technology because technology was beginning to come into force at that point. And you want to support an organization um, and the importance of that. So the boomers are tend to be a little bit more linear than some of the other generations. And we'll see that as we come. Maybe um, a little more loyal to organizations. Yes, it was almost about- to a, Almost to a fault. I mean, there were times that I would have left an organization, but I felt like I owed it to them because they gave me a job. You know, it, it was it was interesting, you know, and I was in the military. So when I went in the military, I went in to go in for three years. And after three years, I was going to get out. And 25 years later, I got out. So I felt a real loyalty and I still do to this day to the military and my my organization. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I was just thinking about, and I don't want to trump what you're going to say about generation X, but, you know, just to put it in the context of what you've shared right now, I don't see the, you know, generation X, Y, Z, I don't see them being as loyal to their workplace as the boomers have been, you know, cause there's more focus on, um, loyalty to a cause instead of an organization, I think. Is that, would you say that was true? Oh, absolutely. And it, that's actually a really good lead in to the Generation X. They were the smallest generation. They're, you know, we had the baby boomers after the war. Now the, all the babies were born. Now this is a much smaller generation. And part of that, this is the first time there were several shifts with the Generation X that are significant. Um, one was, it was the first time you started seeing both parents working. So you have both parents working and all of a sudden the kids are, the latchkey kids are home alone or um, having to sort of fend for themselves and starting to look at the world a little differently. They're not seeing the work-life balance because their parents are working all the time and they're thinking, wait a minute, I want to have balance for my kids, for my family. I want family time, I want work time. And you see the Generation X for the first time asking why. As a boomer, my boss would say, you know, jump here. And I'd say, how high? The Generation X would come in and say, I don't want to jump. I want to go this way. And I'd be like, excuse me? I'm the boss here. You're supposed to, you're, I'm hiring you. But they're saying, well, that's okay. But I want to understand why it makes sense. To me, it doesn't. Because if I come in at this shift, Instead of this one, I can have time with my family, but I can also support those others that work these hours too. So I can work later in the day. Doesn't that just make sense? And they started pushing back 
And the bot, you know, the boomers would say, well, if you're not going to follow what we say, then bye. And they'd say, bye. They didn't have the loyalty to the organization, just like you said. They were more about work as a task to bring money to support the family. And they wanted that balance. And the other huge thing that happened during the Xers time was we started having a technology boom. Technology exploded. All of a sudden you have Xbox and you have these other things coming into play and you have technology as a resource. So that was a big deal. Um, some of the other events that took place, Watergate, there was an energy crisis. Um, remember the Challenger disaster came into play. During that time, Desert Storm. A lot of the Xers remember Desert Storm. Uh, both parents working. So it was a time of this group starting to say two things. One, I want more balance. I want work-life balance and I want to know why. If I'm going to do something, I want to understand why. And the second thing was um, technology. So they questioned and they wanted technology to work together to make life better for their family and not be so skewed as the boomers were an all work. So think about that attitude coming into the workplace. It's very different. So what you see in this generation is a whole lot of entrepreneurs right. because they said, you know what? <laughs> if I can't get this from this organization, I can do it myself. I have the technology, I have the resources, and this gives me flexibility. Why not? So if you want to work with and keep a Generation X, give them some technology, give them some flexibility, and listen to their ideas, and then give them a direction and let them run, because they'll do it. They will run things better than you could have even imagined, but you have to understand their perspective. And here's the other thing that this generation started, and the millennials, I think, even capitalized on it more, and the Generation Z is following suit. And that is they're starting to want to give back to their community. They're a cause-driven group. So I love this about the Xers and the millennials because my generation didn't really do that so much. We gave everything to the organization. But now all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, I want to support this cause, this issue, this organization. And they have this identification. So if you think about that in your business, oh my gosh, that could be powerful. If you've got, if you have a cause that everyone identifies with, you're going to have support like crazy and people feel like they're making a difference. So that's really, that's really important. Um, uh, this generation saw a lot of achievement through, there was, Olympics was big and People were doing things, but they wanted the family too. So yeah, it's big. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's really interesting because you're right. I think the fact, not in every case, but you know, as a, a generation that we're taking a look at under a microscope, if you will, um, you know, many had both parents going to work, you know, to achieve a higher standard of living. And as a result, those children being latchkey kids, they didn't have as much parental guidance. So they had more, you know, a freedom and assimilating from the culture. So I think that's why, you know, we're seeing them being more independent and they're not, you know, I remember being a little girl, I, if I was told to do something and I, you know, kind of gave pushback, I would get that look. It's like, <laughs> hey, just go do it. Just go do it. You know, I don't have to explain myself. Whereas, you know, the Generation X, it's like, well, why do you want me to do that? They want to understand that, right? So they they're not, it, it's not just just do what I say. Don't, don't, don't question me. They had the flexibility and they weren't used to that and they were they explored that. So I think it's really interesting. Um, the, you know, the variations in in how a child is raised the constraints in which society as a whole demands them to be respectful, if you will, right? Or to have a little more freedom to question. 
So, so this is really interesting. So, um, so let's jump into the millennials. That's my kids' generation, and and mine as well. And so that's between 1980 and 2000. So they're you know now into their late 20s, 30s, um, and they are definitely in the workforce. They're definitely in just about every area of the economy right now. And if we as entrepreneurs or we as business folks or we as families want to be able to connect, we need to understand this generation. It's in many ways, this one and the Xers, I think, are probably the least understood because people think they come in with attitude and that they only care about themselves. But we have to stop and think what was going on during their those formative years. So what took place then? 9-11? You bet they all know exactly what was going on 9-11. Um, technology started in X's, but oh my gosh, it's exploding. You know, you had your whole IBM and Apple controversy and the whole thing. That was all during their, their time frame, and they were involved in everything. It was like they're really busy, busy, busy lives. Um, you know, three or four activities after school, some before school, during school, and you're, you're in this club, that club, you know, marching band art, you know, it, it was, they were so busy with sports, with everything. And then there was this crazy technology and violence that was happening around them, the shootings, the school shootings kind of exploded and, and the 9-11 and Columbine. I mean, so many things were happening that it really impacted them and how they look at things. So they're now, remember they came right after this big affluent period where the parents said, you know, the sky's the limit. We're already seeing that we're on the moon. You can do it. So now they're trying to pull all of this together. So they come in to organizations full of ideas, full of excitement, full of all of this. And they feel like they can be in charge. My son literally, went into his very first job and on day two thought he could be the CEO. And of course I, as a boomer, I'm just trying to keep from laughing as he's telling me this because he's all, he's very serious. He had studied the organization. He knew exactly what they needed. He had a list of what they needed to do to get better. What he didn't know was that he didn't have the experience that the other generations had. So this generation comes in gusto or uncertain. You have kind of both extremes in this generation. You have those that, like my son, that I'm doing everything and my daughter, free spirit artist, not sure what she wants to do with life. Both are very common in this generation because of the uncertainty of the world and because of the possibilities of the world. So both are there. Mm. So my son though, didn't have any experience um, as an art architect, which is what he went into. And so what he had to learn was the experience. So one of the best strategies with this group, mentors. Connect them with a mentor for those areas where there's a gap in experience. So like my son has three distinct mentors, one for speaking, one for architecture, and one for his faith. And by the way, they're all boomers because that's who he talks to to find out, you know, hey, what do you think about this? And he brings up his ideas. And if he gets a boomer or he gets a veteran that will listen to him, oh my gosh, his ideas will go like crazy. And I'm sure you've heard, oh, you have to like, you have to constantly praise them. You have to constantly, it's all about them. You know, oh, they don't, they only think about themselves. Well, again, if you look at their perspective, there was all these things that were being provided that had never been provided before that were around the world we wanted to do for them. And we would do groups and teams and things and we would always tell them, gosh, you did great. I'm glad you participated. You know, I mean, it was sort of like, congratulations, you worked hard for that F. <laughs> In my generation, working hard for an F is not an okay thing. <laughs> working, getting an F is not okay, but their generation, they, they heard that. So my son would say, I don't need a trophy. I don't need to have you put me up on a stage and say you're the best thing next to sliced bread. What I need is for you to tell me, hey, you're on track. You're doing a good job. He right. says, I'll work my butt off on a project, but if I hear nothing, I'm assuming I'm, you don't care. So I might as well do something else. 
Yeah, they want to be acknowledged. They want to be acknowledged. But, yeah. you know, Stacy mentioned this in the chat box, and I was thinking at the same time, Stacy, because we're, in, on, we're tracking on this, is there came a time where, you know, everybody gets a trophy. It's not just, you know, like, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to leave anybody out. We don't want to hurt Susie and Joey's, you know, feelings. But, I mean, I think there's something, some merit to aspiring to something. Because I remember as a baby boomer, you know, I'd see somebody do something, accomplish something, and I that would motivate me because I wanted to be up there getting that legitimate trophy that I had earned, not a token trophy. So it's interesting how, you know, we've shifted in wanting to, like you say, in the millennials, lots of activities, very, very busy lives. And, and I love what you said about the uncertainties of the world and then the tension of the possibilities of the world. So yeah. there's, you know, both things that are that are really impacting that generation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's fascinating because they they come in and and have so much to offer, but people misinterpret it. Yes. They think that what they're doing is just caring about themselves. And my son will say, he says, "I get it. I'm high maintenance. It's true." I mean, he'll say that, and he said it. He said, "But I I'm not high maintenance in that I need these big accolades. I just need someone to say." That's what I needed. Perfect. Thank you. Then I'll, I'm, I'm good to go. And, you know, and people just need that. I think we all do. But this generation probably needs it a little bit more because there was that period of that's what they got was a lot of that. And now they're in the workforce where they're feeling uncertain. And if they don't get that feedback, then they, they want to move on. And you also they have trouble keeping this generation too in, in the workforce. And so um, one of the conferences we did, a whole bunch of boomers were in the group and they said to my son, they said, okay, we don't get you. So tell me, how do I keep you at work? What, what, what is gonna keep you? If, if you don't care about the organization, what, what can we do to keep you? He said, well, if you really wanna know, and then he has all of these ideas. And so what he started to do at his organization, his boss actually did that. He said, okay, if you really want to know, then you have to be willing to listen. So then once a month, he met with all the millennials and he said, okay, talk to me, tell me what's working, what's not, what ideas you have. And he listened. And then those that made sense, they employed. One of them was they did a uh, luncheon once um, a month, every person on the dime of the company, that was something my son specified, was <laughs> on the company's dime, uh, everyone would go to lunch with someone they didn't know in, from the company and just talk, just get to know each other. And that developed relationships and helped people realize where there were gaps and where there weren't and how they could partner and how they get opened up all kinds of doors. And it was a really positive thing. And my son felt like, hey, what I say matters. So now he wants to stay with his organization because he feels that it's going to help. He also needs to see upward mobility. If there's no upward mobility, there's no promotion, there's nothing in there, he's going to move on. He doesn't have the loyalty. It's not that he, he's not engaged. And the other thing, I have another colleague that I work with, it's a millennial, and he says, um, you know, everybody thinks we're just all technology, but he said, I really like the face-to-face, person-to-person more. And he said, I won't even set up a Zoom with anybody right up front. I want to talk to them first, and then I will get together or meet them or talk to them, and then we can set up these other things. And he said, you know, we, we look at, people look at the generation um, as uh, all about themselves, but he said, really, we're more about cause. We're really more about identifying with a brand. So like, if a company has a brand that they're really proud of or that you identify with, that the millennial identifies with, they'll travel miles to go to a coffee shop. If they feel that coffee shop meets their branding beliefs. So when you partner a passion, a belief, a brand, that's a loyalty even stronger than the loyalty the boomers had, which is powerful if you're a business owner or you're reaching out to this this organization. So pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I know we've got one more to, to bring in here, but I, I agree with you on that. My daughter lives in Boston. She's 
She's a barista, managed three, owned, co-owned three coffee houses in Boston, loves coffee. And every time she comes to visit me, she'll go to this narrative coffee house because she identifies with them. And I mean, that's her place. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> so there, that resonates with me because you're right. It's, you know, they, they feel a connection with that, that belief or that brand. So let's let's uh, finish up here so we can open up for Q and A um, with the Generation I, which for internet, as you mentioned, or Generation Z or the globals, or Z, I guess you get you said right Z Z. So it's X Y Z, yeah. right? And this generation is uh, getting a, a lot of attention right now because if you think about it, look at what they're facing. Does it sound like any of the other generations you're thinking about it? Think about the things that are happening right now. Pandemic, war, economic collapse, school shooting, uncertainty about the future, natural disasters. What does that do to the mindset of the person between eight and 18? What other generation had that similar experience? The veterans. Yeah, the veterans generation. Lots of similarities between this current generation that's just entering the workforce and the veterans. But the big difference is, can you think what it is? What's the difference between then and now? Well, you got it. Technology, Stacey yeah. got it. That's yeah. the difference. And it's it's really key because it's good and it's bad. It's good because boy, we can we can still keep connected um, via things like this with Zoom. We can still reach out to our grandparents, to our parents, to our family, but at the same time, it keeps us isolated from the personal touch. And so you don't have that family pulling together. If you look at our world today, we're sort of separating instead of pulling together. And what that does is it makes this generation a high risk for mental issues, for depression, for isolation, for not knowing how to socialize, for um, not having some of the coping skills. Lots and lots of counseling happening right now. Um, with because of COVID and the isolation and the shifting from school, um, there's there's a lot of examples out there of tough things, and we have to be aware of that in our business and in our families and our households, because this generation is bringing up lots of skill, but they don't have the drive that the millennials had they probably and speaking of drive they a lot of them don't even care about getting a car I don't need to I can walk or I can take a bus or I can go or I can just stay here and use my computer I don't need that that was like freedom to my generation we could hardly wait to get our driver's license I predict this generation is not going to be going off and running to go to college I predict this generation is going to do more like the veterans generation and want to do trades, do tech, technical skills, do trade skills, things like that. And that's not a bad thing. Um, I think there's a big place for that. Sometimes we get overeducated and forget about the connection. And, and I think trade schools and trade things are good, but sometimes you have issues with even motivation. It's like, I don't even want to go do that, you know? And then, then of course the parents, have had homeschooling thrown on them and they're not expecting, experienced, desired, skilled, it can be really challenging um, you know, for the families and, and trying to do their best. And then the teachers are trying to figure it out too. You know, How do we make this work and how do we use the technology and how do we do it all? And it's, we've been learning as we go and we've been failing as we go and we've been surviving as we go. It's been an interesting time. So when we look at this generation, understanding that and understanding how much uncertainty they're experiencing and self-confidence challenges potentially 
with this generation, um, it can make a difference. And if we can give them that support, so they're gonna be high maintenance too. They're gonna need some of those accolades because they just really don't know they're, they're doing a little of that, but it doesn't mean they're less able. They're very able. We just have to be aware that they're experiencing so much uncertainty that of course they're gonna have some of that themselves. It's not like with the, within the boomers, we saw all everything succeeding, so we didn't look at that. Now things are shifting a little, it feels like to the right direction. Hopefully the kids are gonna see that and we're gonna feel it and we're gonna pull out of this just like we did before. History right. can repeat and hopefully we learn from it. So, well, there's, yeah, I think you're painting a beautiful picture here of really what this generation is gonna be dealing with. And I think it's important for us to you know, be aware of that so we know how to to support them, you know, in, in giving them the reassurance that they need, um, providing that stability, you know, because as much as it's been disruptive with parents homeschooling where they don't, you know, haven't been prepared or choosing to do that. I mean, I got, I chose to do that. I researched it. I prayed about it. You know, it yeah. wasn't thrust upon me. Um, and even then it was, it was difficult. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important that, um, you know, for generation I and or Z, whatever it's termed, is to to give them that and you know just support and listening. That's what I'm hearing you say. Um, it, it just occurred to me just to wrap this up that because um, I know we've gone a little bit over, but it's just fascinating information that you've been giving us, Karen. Um, that the millennials and Generation Z. Um, <laughs> I've always kind of joked about this with my kids. I feel like they they use Google is their grandma. They're not as open to the perspective of the older generation and what yeah. we know and have experienced. They're just not open to it at all. And I'm like so excited, like, okay, you know, I, I had I, words of wisdom spoken to me by my grandma and my mom that I, they were like pearls that I held on to and helped me. And it's like, I want to be able to do that for my, you know, my kids and grandkids they're not open to it at all. I, I think you will find though, that if we do um, strategic partnering between the generations, that some of those pearls of wisdom will come out. This generation does like to listen to the stories of the veterans generation. And if we can partner strategically, we can see some of that blending and the excitement happen. And the same thing, and I, I'd love to, I want to close out with just to give you a taste of, of um, what you can do with marketing related to the generation. So let me give you a kind of a fun example. So let's say what we wanted to sell was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. How we sell that to the different generations in marketing can look very different. So for example, if I were going to market a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to a veteran, I would say something like the homegrown peanut butter and jelly, how to bring your family together with a sandwich that tastes and feels like home. I love it. Now let's contrast that to the generation Z who experienced some of the same things, but now have technology. So you have to think about that when you market. So here's an example of what I might say to Gen Z. The peanut butter and jelly goes viral. The secret to an Instagram ready sandwich worth posting that might just change the world. Now, do you see what I'm appealing to there? Right. I'm appealing to the technology, the instant, the way they communicate, but also changing the world because that's what this generation identifies with. So that's the importance of taking your understanding of what a generation experienced and applying it then to how you communicate and how you market. 
Oh, that's brilliant. And it really incorporates the subtleties of the, the generations. You know, when you bring in the Instagram and, you mm -hmm. know, capturing the picture, it's, it's Instagram worthy, you know, I, I think that's hysterical. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've gone over here, but I just want to give the listeners on the line an opportunity to ask questions or enter into the conversation. So feel free to unmute yourself. And if you have anything you want to share, whether it be a question, an epiphany, an aha, or just uh, comment on any of the, uh, the different uh, generations that you've outlined, then Stacy, go for it. Of course, uh, the person that's here working at my house is just about done, so it's going to coincide with this. But uh, I really wanted to tune in because, like I said, my family, yes, I do work with multiple generations in my family business, but we work with families. In fact, our, um, our motto is that our family is here for your family. So, And what I wrote in the beginning is that in one case, we are working with four generations of one family and multiple like three generation families and things. So I don't know if you know, Karen, um, my, uh, our business, uh, we are financial planners and advisors. So it's really great. My dad actually started the firm 34 years ago. So we have these relationships. So this is an awesome talk for me to clue in on. And, um, you know, it would be good to uh, have this kind of information when I'm talking to different people or reaching out mm -hmm. to talk to different people. Um, you know, it's so important when we're talking to, you know, well, it's it, this is really good information. I really appreciate it because, you know, a lot of times we think we're just talking to the boomers because, you know, it's not just about retirement. Retirement is just one part of our life. You know, it's just one, you know, so, uh, you know, and it is interesting when you talk about those uh, Generation I, Z, whatever, you know, they're the ones that think they should do, um, you know, just do it online and all this stuff, you know, they and, you know, that's really the worst thing to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they think they know what they're doing. They think they want it instantaneous, you know, things like that. So um, anyway, I just want to say I really appreciate this information. It gives me a lot to think about and uh, how I might market to these, you know, all different ages. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And I, we've developed a couple of tools that I can, um, if if you're interested, I can send to you some little things that my son and I just put together that sort of identify the different generations and then things that kind of upset them, things that uh, sort of their leadership style and then things that if you want to communicate with them at sort of a, a diagonal thing, you can, and I'd be happy to share those with you. Oh, that would be so great. Um, we're going to be having our um, retreat here next week. So really something to be you know, putting our plans together for, you know, the coming year. So I'm putting my, um, my email in the chat here. So perfect. Perfect. Thank and then I can so send that to you. All right. Well, I see that I am getting a invoice here, so I'm going to have to <laughs> sign off you guys for joining us. Thank you so much. Stacey. Stacey. Thank yeah, you. And, and you two need to collaborate. Maybe Karen can be a speaker for you for, you know, your, um, your clients or something. Who knows? That would be really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, take my email and then please send me an email so that maybe we could collaborate on something like that. Okay. That would be great. All right. All right. Thanks, Stacey. Oh, I Thank guess you. I pushed enter. <laughs> there we <laughs> go. You, I see it there. Everybody have a good day. <laughs> Thanks nice. a lot, Cindy. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. All right. Bye. 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 So we'll have one more question, one or two more questions. If anybody else wants to unmute and or enter into our conversation, we we started a little bit late, so I'll go a couple minutes over. Uh, I have a comment to Karen is uh, I have a son who is 28, so he's a millennial. And probably my biggest frustration with him is that like him and his friends, he has quite a few friends and stuff, and I've been heavily involved with them through sports and all that. But uh, what frustrates me is it's like they don't want to research anything. And so they'll come to me and they want instant answers. What's, what's the right thing to do? What do I need to do? I don't want to read books and I don't want to do research. I just want to know the answer. And that's always kind of frustrated me. Yeah, and 
and technology has done that to us. You know, it gives us, we want instant, we want instant answers. We want to look it up. We don't need to learn how to spell. We don't need to learn proper grammar because we can just click a button to fix it for us. Yes. So we don't have to, we don't have to know that. So I think um, a strategy that I would use there would just be to not give them the answer and tell them, you know, let me know what you find out because I'd like to know that too. And let them, you know, come back to you. And then you can also share um, a lesson you learned because you went through it versus someone just telling you. Because it really didn't well, matter if they just told me. So an example of that. But, you know, they may or may not be ready to hear that. <laughs> well, I, yeah. The, and they're also frustrated with me because that's what I do. I'd say, well, let's research the answer. No, I want the answer. <laughs> For research so they get frustrated with me you yeah. know as well but i've known these kids so for so long you yeah. know okay well and, and what happens is they come back later and say oh now i know why you did that part of that is just growing up but it's also very heavy in this generation because everything was sort of given to them yeah, so they have time. to they have to learn and my son we'll come back and, and share. I mean, there were all, oh, he knew everything. No one could tell him <laughs> anything that he knew the answer. And now he realizes, you know what? I don't know the answer to all of this and I do need to, you know, and he discovered when he had all of a sudden when COVID hit as an architect, he did a lot of face-to-face -face and design and he had to now work with teams online and he had to figure out how to get these partnerships online. And so he did something that it, he got a lot of pushback for, and now they, they asked for it. And that was, he would say, okay, John, I want you to uh, tune in on, on Zoom at the same time as Chuck. You can work on separate projects, but I want you on the same Zoom. And they're like, what? <laughs> and he said, because Chuck has the experience John, you don't. Now you have someone right there that you can ask questions of if you need to. And they're like, oh, this is so stupid. But what happened was they developed relationships through Zoom and they realized, oh, I can. And it sped up their productivity significantly. So it was kind of an mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, Thank you so much, Karen, for all the great information and the strategies for marketing to target generations. Um, I, we could spend a lot more time on this call, and I'm sure you have a wealth of information to, to still share with us, but really appreciate you taking the time. We look forward to having you be a part of our community and sharing your wisdom even more. Um, but for those who are listening to this uh, conversation on the replay um, and those who are on the call as well, um, you know, tell us how they can find out more about you and what you and your son are offering through Click Consultants and how to work with you. So probably the easiest way to connect is either to go to our website, which is www.clickconsultants.com and it's click-consultants.com. And and uh, we'll we'll put that in the the summary to attach to the this video, um, or you can go to our Facebook business page and reach out there, or email. So any of those those all will link back to an email. And I'm also open to phone calls. And um, it we like to help people with all types of communication challenges. So you partner with businesses to help them to understand. You give presentations. Um, you're an author. So there's all kinds of resources that you can make available to the community. Yes. Yes. Okay. I do keynotes, workshops, one-to-one, -one, customize, um, just answer questions, help people, you know, kind of work through a challenge. Uh, those types of things. And uh, we have a few other tracks that you can see also online that we do. 
Awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time to share with our community. We just really appreciate all the wisdom that you've brought to us and uh, lots of food for thought. So um, thank you. And thank you for everyone who joined us. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we hope you'll tune in um, uh, the first Wednesday of every month. We nominate different members of our community um, as well as the fourth Wednesday. So if you ever miss anything, check out our YouTube channel and you can listen to the replay. So thanks guys.